Tomb Raider, The Angel of Darkness, adapted from the novelization by J.R. Millward, based on an original story by Murty Schofield. With J.R. Millward and Adam Coover. With music by Peter Connolly and Martin Iverson. Episode 1. There were a hundred reasons why I didn't want to come to Paris. For a start, it was raining. Not so long ago, in the open desert, I would have counted rain a welcome luxury, but not now. It pelted down, hammering against the ground like a two-year-old having a temper tantrum, drenching the trees, tossing branches, and shining greasily on the paved streets. Thunder prowled the rooftops stabbing aerials and isolated chimneys. The Parisian night-goers were conspicuous by their absence. I trudged alone through the darkness, feet squelching, fighting a growing sense of disquiet. I'm perfectly at ease in my own company, and indeed have been reveling in little else for the past two years. But as I walked down those streets, I felt an irrepressible chill that things were not as they should have been. Something was keeping people indoors, and it wasn't just the weather. There should have been newspaper vendors, tourists returning home to their hotels, and taxi drivers copping a quick smoke as their engines idled. There should have been somebody besides myself braving this stormy night. But then again, I wasn't exactly here by choice. I wiped rainwater out of my eyes as I scanned the building names on this street. It was a handsome-looking district, with poplar trees every few yards fenced in against dogs and pools of chilly neon from wrought iron street lamps. The Chantelle building loomed more than most. As I stood there, I spotted a shadow moving behind some curtains, the suggestion of a limp betraying its owner. Werner von Croy, the renowned archaeologist, academic, sometime vessel of the ancient Egyptian god of chaos, and the second reason I did not want to be here. I rubbed my hands to restore the circulation. I had come to Paris on the Eurostar, and arrived at Gare du Nord station less than an hour ago. I had neither raincoat nor umbrella, although the rain was already overflowing the gutters, and there had been plenty of taxis waiting onto the building's eaves. I had stubbornly, perhaps perversely, decided to go on foot. Seeing the warm glow behind those curtains was a reminder of how cold I was beneath my sodden clothes. Nevertheless, I hung back before I rang the buzzer. Anyone who knows me would probably have been surprised by my hesitation. I have confronted things no other human has ever seen, defeated some of the most powerful and devious forces on Earth. Yet here I was, anxious about coming face to face with my elderly mentor. The irony almost made me smile. Werner, it's Lara. In too short a time, I was standing outside his door. With difficulty, I bottled down my emotions. There was anxiety, wondering if there would be anything left of my friend and mentor that I could recognise. Bitterness, like the sourness of death in my belly, remembering the last time I'd seen him. And anger, most potent of all, knowing he had so easily persuaded me to visit him. When the door swung open and his face met mine, I also knew I had missed him. Lara! Thank God. Come in, come in. Expecting trouble? Expecting? Oh, no, it's just a precaution. With Paris as it is, you understand. Can I take your jacket? No? Ah, of course. Can I offer you anything? Tea? Coffee? Or something stronger? 
I followed the sound of his voice through into the living area. Oh, well-furnished space, as far as I could tell, with my attention focused so narrowly. His cane thumped with every other step. Its jackal-shaped head was inlaid with gold, lapis lazuli, and had garnets for eyes. An uncomfortable and perhaps disquieting homage to Set, the Egyptian god who had briefly shared Vernus' existence. I wondered why on earth my friend would have kept such a thing, except out of morbid sentimentality. Thank you. No. Of course. Please, make yourself comfortable. Robotically, I sank onto a chair. More trouble than I would have admitted. This skinny old man bore not a trace of the proud and vigorous gentleman I had once known and had expected. Where was his authority? His charisma? What had happened to the adventurer who had travelled across the wilds of Asia, deep into the Cambodian jungle, all those years ago? Where was the veteran who had chased me halfway across Egypt? Surely he could not be the same person who now sat in the chair opposite me. His whole frame had shrunken like a piece of worm-ridden wood, bent almost double under some invisible strain. The hands that cupped the head of his cane were twisted like fleshless claws, and what little hair he had left had faded to the death white of a shroud. <clears throat> I know this was rather an abrupt request, Lara, but I'm glad you're here. Did, did you walk here by yourself? Not taxi. Why do you look so surprised? Don't tell me Paris is dangerous. Oh, no, it isn't. Not usually. Not at normal times. Well, then, these are hardly normal times. Have you? Heard? No, you might not have. Archaeologists rarely take much interest in current affairs. Is it the Monstrum? The serial killer every paper is full of? Killings. Yes. Well, the whole city won't stop talking about it. It's not surprising people are afraid to walk the streets, even in broad daylight. But I digress. I have something for you. I had it restored exactly as it was. What? Ah, oh, my old backpack. Vanna! How did you find it? It took a while. And he told me the whole tale, right there and then. How he had toiled to reach me under the pyramid for weeks after most people had advised him to give up, and how desperate he had been to atone for his mistakes. The whole time, I sat with my hands wrapped protectively around the backpack, not looking at him or anything except my memories. While he had been excavating my supposed final resting place, I had been living amongst the Tuareg, undergoing my own form of rebirth. What had emerged from under the pyramid from battling Set had looked like me and sounded like me, but it was only a shadow. Putai, the shaman who pulled me from death, had helped me regain a part of myself lost years before I set foot in Egypt, before my passion for archaeology had become the engine powering my life. My physical wounds upon defeating Set were as nothing to the scars I hadn't even realised I carried. But she, and others, had helped me set on a path of healing. That had been just over two years ago. Quickly, girl, before it collapses around you! You! You could have saved me! You coward! Lara, his own heart is for him to understand. If I can master myself, he should too. If not, he's weak, and I hate him. I hate him! I couldn't leave you! You already have! You have forgiven yourself. Now you must learn to forgive others as well. Not him. Never him. Once, unknowingly, I had lived using anger as my primary fuel. 
the fury born from survivor's guilt that I had carried ever since my fiancé died in a plane crash in the Himalayas. That event had scarred me deeper than anyone realised at the time, despite the feelings of unprecedented freedom I had experienced in learning to fend for myself. However, the woman who had survived for two weeks in the mountains had not adapted to her former life in England quite so well. I could still remember how I had fled my homecoming party and dashed barefoot through the grounds till the chatter of the simpering, shallow-minded guests was muffled by acres of manicured laurel bushes and climbing roses. I had found shelter behind a fragrant clematis and looked on myself with freshly opened perspective. My emerald silk dress, chosen to bring out the hazel of my eyes, was now nothing more than a bloody nuisance that hindered running and made climbing an impossibility. The high-heeled shoes I had discarded in a flower pot might have been the height of elegance, but would have spelled frostbite and death compared to the protection of woolen socks and stout hiking boots. <sighs> Even the party itself was a travesty. Hardly anyone had acknowledged the black drapes, the tribute to my dead fiancé but instead had pestered me with questions and comments about how dreadful the experience must have been for me. Poor thing. Hardly out of finishing school. Surely there must be another handsome man to support her. Poor thing. Such a brave young lady. There, there. Oh, have another glass. There's a place for you in our house if you ever want it. Poor thing. Poor thing. The epithet had rung in my ears until I was almost screaming. Even the well-meaning sentiments of my old friends had become a curse. And right there I had made my decision. My mind strayed to the collection of medals in my bedroom drawer, the awards for record-breaking physical and mental achievement at Gordonston. While still only a teenager... I had ventured into and emerged safely from the heart of Cambodia. I had survived a fortnight alone in the Himalayas, while my fiancé and everyone else aboard the plane had perished. I was not a poor thing, nor ever would be. The anger was still bubbling in my veins when I returned to the manor and politely but firmly told my guests to leave. My eye had fallen on a National Geographic magazine on the coffee table, exactly as it had done when I was 16 years old, and I had felt my first genuine smile up since returning. Archaeology had always been a hobby of mine, but with my urgent desire to escape the trappings of aristocracy, it soon became my overriding passion. There weren't many days when I couldn't be found in the British Library, or even at my computer, losing myself in the depths of history and legend. Soon, I was attending archaeological seminars chaired by famous names every other month. Despite my father's disapproval, I took my family credit card and organised trips to Cairo, Shetland and the Congo in search of ancient sites. Those trips awakened my knowledge in a way that mere library books could not, and it wasn't long before I was one of the famous names at seminars and publishing papers of my own. However, the anger within me had not gone away. Every time I stepped up to the podium or submitted my latest groundbreaking thesis, my mind would turn back to the abandoned sites I had visited or the hardships I had endured in the wilderness. Lecture halls and conference centres became as suffocating as the tombs I excavated, but with none of the latter's excitement. Only when I was alone again, walking out into the fresh air or facing danger and death with only my wits to protect me, did my anger metamorphose from discomfort to exhilaration. Even when my father finally disowned me for bringing the family name into disrepute, I had treated the event as fresh fuel for my internal fire. My adventures became more demanding as I demanded more for myself. 
My emotional restraint had proved exceedingly useful in armouring me against the shadier aspects of treasure hunting. The black marketeers and thieves, the hired guns and the gangsters eager for the taste of glory and gold. The euphoria of the chase had become the engine that would propel me through the worst of dangers, always allowing me to emerge triumphant with the prize. <sighs> Only as the years passed did I come to understand the dark price of my emotional arrangement. The hunger that could never be fulfilled. No quest was too deadly, no artifact too difficult to obtain, until the day I confronted my own death. I had hoped my time in the desert and subsequent reclusive lifestyle might have cured my addiction. It had been the sole thing keeping me sane in the time since my escape from Set. I looked up, and Verna visibly shrank from my gaze. Evidently I was wrong. Enough talk, Verna. Why did you really ask me here? <sighs> to help me, Lara. I need you to get something for me. Go on. I'm tracking five obscure paintings for a client called Eckhart. But he's a psychopath. Obscure paintings? Clients? These had nothing to do with me, or us. It took all my willpower to stay in my chair, my mask firmly in place. Why should I care? Because I'm being stalked. People are dying out there. You've dealt with worse. Handle it, Werner. Lara, please. Look, go and see this woman, Carvier. Here's her dress. She can help... What? Not doing your own research these days? <sighs> Lara, please don't think badly of me. I've been under too much strain recently, and you're the only one who can help. If you would only... Only what? Old man. I won't be used by anyone, least of all you. You should know that by now. Lara, please. You've got to help me. For pity's sake. <sighs> I'm going. I'd had enough. Disappointment overlaid my vision. I had come here expecting to find my old colleague, hale and bombastic, not this snivelling creature begging me for favours. As he made to grab my wrist, I turned on him, forcing him back into his chair, not caring that he cringed from my temper. Egypt, Werner. You walked away and left me. There was no pity then. Get out! I barely felt the gun jab into my stomach when head-splitting pain crashed into my skull, knocking me cold. It might have been the stillness that woke me. I flexed my limbs, wondering how I had come to lie in such an awkward position. On the floor. In the dark. The noise of the storm rumbled overhead. A sickly, metallic stench was drilling into my brain like an alarm bell. The reek of fresh blood. Lots of it. In a daze, I staggered to my knees, pushing myself upright as the room and my head swung with conflicting shadows. It took a moment for the confusion to abate. Phantom images coming and going with memories. Memories of what? A struggle? Had I fought someone? There were muzzy echoes in my eardrums, the sound of a gunshot, really close. I thought I remembered a scream. Had that been me? An intruder? Or oh, Werner? I saw him and immediately felt the ground rush back up as I fell at his side. I was shaking my head in furious denial, not sure if I was still dreaming. He lay on his side curled up 
like a child asleep on the Persian rug. A rug that was slowly turning oily black in the street lamp's flickering light. Gently, I lifted him onto my lap, turning his face toward mine. All I cradled was an empty shell. I was too shocked to weep or to scream or to do anything other than take in the horrific death in my arms. Verna's eyes, no longer hidden behind glasses, were stretched wide in terror, mouth gaping. The crisp grey cotton of his shirt was unmarked, pristine, right down to where the cavity of his stomach drew the eye like some sickening magnet. There, the blood pooled, drenching the floor, soaking through his trousers and probably even now dripping through some unfortunate ceiling. Something, or someone, had reached in and scooped out his organs with the ease of cupping a handful of water from a bucket. Silvery light twinkled across his body until I realized that actual silver was splashed like droplets of mercury over his gaping wounds. My heart thumped with extra insistence as I sat there, rocking him while my head grew clearer. It was then I saw the markings daubed above my head, up the walls, across the fireplace and paintings. There were symbols and arcane images drawn in the only substance available in that quantity. None of them were recognizable, but at that point, I was beyond caring what they were saying. That was my friend's blood on the wall. Something new sloshed inside of me, all but replacing my revulsion. Desire surged through my mind as I slowly rose to my feet, not taking my eyes from Verna's remains. Desire for revenge. My hands came up without my volition, smeared with hot gore. I suddenly longed to find whoever did this and closed those same hands around their throat to squeeze the life from them just as Verna's life had been. The feeling was so overwhelming that it took me a few seconds to realize there were sirens approaching. My mind was made up in a split second. I couldn't afford to waste one breath in a police cell awaiting questioning. Automatically, I strapped on the backpack, assessing my situation. The window beckoned, but as I moved towards it, flashing police lights warned me back. It was as though I had suddenly developed a split personality. Part of me forced my body through the door, down the corridor and stairs, barging through the emergency exit and down the nearest alleyway. The other part observed with cold dispassion, noting every detail that might be needed later. I knew this side of me intimately, but never so keenly as I felt it take hold as it did now, like a dagger being wetted in my mind. When I swerved back onto the street and saw the police van careen to a halt not 50 yards away, all I felt was contempt. No one was about to stop me hunting Werner's killer. I sneered, taking off in the opposite direction, shouldering my way through a service door. Over the pelting rain, I heard another sound rapidly gaining on me. Police dogs, Rottweilers by the size, and me without anything to throw at them. My feet pounded up the nearest stairs. The building I'd entered was obviously derelict. The doors off the landing were all boarded up, offering no escape. I let my legs decide where to take me, but the dogs were eating up the distance between us. I cursed the entire Paris constabulary for breeding such efficient animals and then cursed some more when I suddenly came up short against a window. There was no time to stand my ground, especially when I had to fling my hands up to save my face from being chewed off by a dog sailing through the air. I felt its weight crash into me, all hot slobber and teeth, and heard the remains of the window splintering as I was forced backwards. In a fight between me and gravity, gravity won. There was only a bin to break my fall, and the pain made spots dance before my eyes as I rolled to the ground, 
dripping and heaving with my ribs on fire. The dogs were barking overhead. Wincing, I climbed to my feet, wondering briefly why my balance seemed off. And then I saw my poor, devoted backpack dangled from a Rottweiler's jaws. He was shaking it mockingly at me, like a prize kill. Well, it certainly would be once the police got their hands on it. There was nothing I could do but run. In episode one of Tomb Raider, The Angel of Darkness, Lara Croft was played by J.R. Millward. Professor Von Croy and Horus were played by Adam Coover. Written and adapted by J.R. Millward. Based on an original story by Murty Schofield. With music by Peter Connolly and Martin Iverson. Additional sound effects courtesy of www.freesfx.co.uk and the BBC. Produced by Stephen Millward. Lara Croft and Tomb Raider are the property of Crystal Dynamics and Square Enix.